This morning, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, we're going to look at another paragraph here, another um, uh, historic account of um, uh, what uh, Jesus did in order to uh, bring out, we might say, another need within the lives of his disciples, which I think will effectively expose also a need within our own lives. Let's read Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the multitude away. And after bidding them farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were frightened. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, last time, uh, I, I've already made allusion to this in my prayer, but we were considering the love and the care that our Lord Jesus Christ has for those uh, who are his, the, the love and care that he has for you if you're trusting in him this morning. We saw that through the love that he showed to his old covenant people. Our Lord Jesus saw all those people who had, had come out to him because they had heard of all the wonderful things he was doing. And when he saw them, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. They had no guide. They had no uh, spiritual leaders. Well, they did have leaders, but those leaders were not leading them in the right direction. And so our Lord Jesus Christ taught them uh, many things. He taught them the things they needed to know for their salvation. And also, of course, when he had taught them for many hours and it was late and they were hungry and the disciples said, send them away. We don't have enough food for everyone. He says, you feed them. And the Lord Jesus had them all sit down and he fed 5,000 with those five loaves and those two fish. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ did many miracles to uh, prove who he was so that those who heard his word would believe his word and would trust his word and would, by God's grace, be saved. But the miracles that he did were not those that didn't benefit anyone. He didn't make trees pop out of the ground or mountains rise or sink or cast mountains into the ocean. That really wouldn't help too many people, especially if your house happened to be on that mountain. But what he did were miracles that benefited the people. He healed their bodies. Uh, he, he cast out demons. And on this occasion, he even fed so many people. He took care of their needs because the Lord is the good shepherd who takes care of the needs of his people. Now, that same love that Jesus had for his old covenant people, he certainly has for those in the new covenant. And he certainly has made the same provisions for each one of you. He has given you his word. He has given to you uh, ministers. He's given to you elders and shepherds. He has given to you uh, books written by uh, those that he's raised up in the history of the church, all to guide you. I mean, none of us have any lack of knowledge today, except those who aren't aware that these resources exist, perhaps are in churches where the word of God isn't being preached in its fullness as it ought to be. But Jesus certainly has made this provision because he loves you and he cares about you. And certainly the Lord has also made promises to take care of your physical needs, those needs which seem to be on our hearts much more than the spiritual ones, which are far more important. He tells us that if we will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that he will take care of all of those needs as well. Jesus actually has provided everything we need for life and for godliness. And again, because he cares for you, because he wants you to survive, he wants you to live, he wants you to live not just physically, but spiritually, he wants you to make it to heaven. And certainly he has made every provision to help you on the way there. Now remember, he does this not just to care for you, but he did this as an example to you because he wants you 
to help others in the same way find their way to heaven. When you see people who are ignorant, people who don't know the word of God, people who don't know the gospel and don't know how to make it to heaven, you need to bring that gospel to them. You need to give them that guidance. You need to show them the way, even as Jesus showed you the way. And when you see people who are in need, physical need, and who will die without your help, although we don't have as many of those around today because the government has done such a great job of taking your money and sharing it with other people, um, we know that that is certainly a problem and something that might stop us from helping other people because it cuts down on our ability to help them. It cuts down on their need, certainly. But the Lord would still have us to help them because if that help comes from us, certainly it opens the door for us to be able to bring the gospel to them. And so here is another example Jesus gives of how we are to serve other people by teaching them and by helping them in their physical needs. Now this morning, the Lord Jesus gives you something else uh, to help you towards heaven. And another example of what you are to do to help others, and that is he gives a warning, a warning against hardness of heart, a warning against a lack of faith. Now we read in our text that after Jesus fed the 5,000, he sent his disciples ahead of him by boat to Bethsaida across the Sea of Galilee, while he sent the crowd away and went away to the mountain in order to pray. And we're certainly going to want, want to come back to that particular uh, thing that Jesus did here, prayer, because it is so important to fight against a hard heart. But when evening came and Jesus had finished his prayer, he looked out to see how far the disciples had gone, and he found that they really hadn't gone very far at all because the wind was against them. They had only reached the middle of this Sea of Galilee, about three or four miles according to John and his gospel. It was about the fourth watch of the night, I guess a time frame between 3 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the morning. And if the disciples had left in the evening around 6 p.m., they had been rowing for at least nine hours and had only gone some three or four miles. And so Jesus, seeing their distress, goes out to help them, comes to them, walking on the water. But in order to help them, he first of all tested them by looking as though he was going to walk right on by. I don't think Jesus really intended to walk by them because the fact or the reason why he went out there in the first place was to help them. But when they saw him, they thought he was a ghost. I mean, here's a man or at least the figure of a man standing out of the water in the dark in the deep and yet he's not sinking. This can't be a man. This has to be a ghost. And they cried out in terror. Every time I think about that picture of just what's going on there, it's, just, it's somewhat humorous, but only because I know, as you do, that that was Jesus. If we had been out in the boat with the disciples and didn't know what Jesus was capable of, we might do exactly as they did. But notice what Jesus does. He immediately comforts them. He spoke with them. He got into the boat, and immediately we read, the winds ceased. Now, Mark writes that when this happened, they were utterly astonished. They were amazed. How, how could it be? And yet the question we should be asking this morning is, why were they so surprised? That was the same question, actually, that Jesus asked and reproached them for. You would think by this time they'd be getting used to the fact that Jesus is able to do extraordinary things, but apparently they weren't. They had not learned what they should have learned from the incident of the loaves, the feeding of the 5,000, or the many other things that they had already seen Jesus Christ do. Instead, their hearts were hardened. They were still having a difficult time believing. Now, there are at least two things I believe that Jesus wants each of us to learn from this this morning. The first is that Jesus did what he did in his ministry, not only, of course, to help other people. As I mentioned, he could have done miracles that didn't help anyone and accomplished that same evidential you know, power, as it were, uh, through that event. If he had cast a mountain into the ocean, that would certainly make people believe. But he did it for another reason, and that was certainly that he might either create faith sometimes, although most of the time the Lord tells us 
They weren't done to engender faith, but rather to strengthen faith. Jesus did what he did, and he expected, of course, a certain response from those who saw these things. But the second thing is that sometimes you can see all of these things and still not be moved to believe. In that case, you need to guard your heart against hardness, becoming hard. So first of all, let's consider that Jesus did what he did in his ministry to strengthen the faith of his disciples, of those who did believe, and to strengthen your faith as well. Now Mark writes that the fact that they were surprised by his walking on the water and calming the wind means that they had not gained any insight. They had not learned what they were to learn from the incident of the loaves. And what is it that they missed? Well, certainly, they should have seen what Jesus was capable of doing so that whatever he did would not be surprising, although I suppose there would still be a certain amount of amazement when you see those things taking place. But they should have known what he was capable of doing, and they should have known by this time through these things exactly who this man was. Now, what was Jesus capable of? Basically, he could do whatever it was he willed to do. And just think about the things we've seen so far in the Gospel of Mark. He had the power to command evil spirits, and those spirits would obey. Now, we may think very little of that, but if there was somebody you were faced with that had an evil spirit, you would see just how dangerous they are and how marvelous it is that someone actually has authority to do this. He had the ability to command even sickness, every sickness, and it would depart. He cast out, well, leprosy from a man and paralysis from another. He had the ability on earth to forgive sins, which is, of course, the most wondrous, the most helpful to us, because apart from that, we would perish. He could declare what was lawful to do and what was not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. In other words, he had authority over the law of God to expound exactly what it means. This one could foretell the future. Remember the kingdom parables. Jesus was telling them what was going to happen in the future. He could certainly command the creation. They've already seen that. The wind and the waves, and even they would obey him. He could raise the dead. He even gave his disciples authority over sickness and evil spirits. He sent them out, and they came back rejoicing that even the evil spirits were subject to, well, to their authority because of what Jesus Christ had done. And, of course, the last thing they saw was the fact that he could feed 5,000 men on basically what was meant to be a boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish. And when he was done, had enough left over to fill 12 full baskets. So that is what Jesus was capable of doing. And actually, he's capable of much more. So what should this have told them about Jesus Christ? Well, for one thing, certainly, that he was God. God in human flesh. It seems as though his human nature kept getting in the way. They kept thinking that he was just a man because that's all he appeared to be in their sight unless he did something extraordinary. And certainly we don't want to depreciate the fact that Jesus was and still is a man. He became a man for our salvation. If Jesus had not become a man and done what was necessary for us to do in order to enter into heaven in his humanity, and if he had not remained a man now in heaven, we could not be saved. But one thing we do need to note from this is this. He was and still is God, the eternal God, the second person of the Godhead. He is, in fact, that God that we worship. Now, this fact is essential to your salvation. You cannot be saved without believing this, because that is who Jesus Christ is. And if you do not believe in a Jesus who is God in human flesh, you do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. And the Jesus you believe in can't save you. You do not owe your salvation or the glory due to your salvation to any mere man, but you owe your salvation to the one who is God and man. Your salvation from first to last is wrought by God. 
Now, if they had known that this was the case from the things that he had done, perhaps they would not be so surprised now that he was walking on the water. But I don't think we can really fault them too much because when you stop and think about it, we have the same problem that they had. And really, we have everything that they had also to demonstrate to us the same things. Now, you were not eyewitnesses to what Jesus Christ did in the way that they were, but you do not have to be an eyewitness in order to believe. And thankfully, that is the case. You have eyewitness accounts inspired by God. You have the testimony of the Holy Spirit in your heart to uh, convince you that these things actually happened. So you should believe, even as they believed. And I think this text, first of all, asks you this morning, do you believe? Do you believe these things? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? Do you even believe that Jesus exists? You know, there are some even professing Christians who struggle with that idea. Do you believe that he exists and that he is who he said he is? That he is the Son of God, the one who actually created the universes, as it were, or the universe, this world, with merely a word? Do you believe that he is the one who is, in fact, sovereign over this creation? And do you believe this strongly enough to have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe what the Bible says about him, that apart from him, there is no salvation? You cannot save yourself apart from Jesus Christ. Only he can save you. Do you believe that the one who is eternally God became a man in order to save you? Do you believe that he provides everything that you need and that you don't have to run around trying to work out how you can make yourself acceptable to God, but you can be acceptable through him? Do you believe that Jesus Christ prays for you in heaven, as we've already seen, keeping you in the grace of God? And do you take these things basically serious enough or seriously enough to actually trust in Jesus Christ and follow him? and confess him before others. You know, we, we do find there are a number of people who are willing to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, and they certainly will tell that to other people. But do you also believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Now, this is, a, this is an area where I think a number of churches fall short, and perhaps you fall short here as well, that he, being God, has the right to tell you what it is you are to do. Do you believe that you should obey him? And are you obeying him? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is sovereign over the things that happen in your life, even as he was sovereign over the wind and the waves and everything that happened in the lives of the disciples? Do you believe that what happens to you is no accident and that God is actually working all things together for your good? Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Lord actually hears your prayers? and answers your prayers. Are you praying in the light of these things? So basically what I'm asking you is this, have you gained any insight from the incidents that have taken place in the Bible, even as the disciples should have, so that they would not be surprised when they see the Lord doing wonderful things? Has your personal experience with the Lord taught you anything about Him? Or do you still get angry when things don't go your way? Do you still worry when difficult times come? Are you still surprised when God answers your prayers? Are you still struggling with what's going to happen to you after you die? Are you still wondering whether there's life after death, whether there's just uh, you know, nothingness, or whether there really is a heaven and a hell, as our Lord Jesus Christ has described in his word? If you're struggling with these things, and you're just like the disciples who had not yet learned what it is they should learn. Now, that moves us to the second point, and it's basically this. That when these things fail to strengthen your faith as they should, it means that in some degree your heart has become hard. And this is what our Lord is telling you that you need to guard against. This was clearly the disciples' problem. Mark writes in verse 52, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. 
but their heart was hardened. In other words, they were still having a hard time believing, believing that these things were true, believing that Jesus was who he said he was. Now, this is interesting because here we have a group of men who actually saw what took place. They were the ones who were the eyewitnesses, and they were still having a hard time. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because there were many, many more people who saw what Jesus Christ did, and they didn't believe at all. Just think about the Pharisees, for instance. We might say that in this case, seeing is not necessarily believing. And again, you need to be thankful that this is true because you will never see with your eyes the things that they saw because those things happened only once. Jesus only became incarnate once. He did those miracles only once. And at the end of that time, he was taken up into heaven. You don't need to see that those things actually happened. All you need to do is to have faith. You need to believe that these things actually happen. As a matter of fact, that's what faith is. Faith is when you don't see, and yet you believe. The author to the Hebrews says basically that in Hebrews 11.1. 1. You know, the faithful of the Old Testament that he goes on to talk about in the, in the book of Hebrews in, in chapter 11 actually appear from Scripture not to have had as much of the Holy Spirit as we have available to us. But it almost seems that more often than not, they believed what God told them, even though for the most part, they many times never saw what God actually had promised. God promised Abraham the, the, the land of Canaan, and yet the only thing he possessed was the parcel of ground that he purchased in order to bury his wife. Uh, he passed that promise on to Isaac, who did not see the fulfillment of it either, and Jacob as well, who died in Egypt, and he didn't see the fulfillment of it. And yet they all died in faith, believing, because they knew that what God says is true. Now again, the disciples saw these things, and they still were wrestling with whether or not Jesus was really who he said he was. And what was their problem? Well, their problem really boiled down to hardness of heart. It boiled down to sin. It boiled down to a lack of God's spirit in their hearts. And I would venture to say that there are some of you struggling with these same things here this morning as well. But you do have to be careful because every time you doubt what God's word says, you in a certain degree grieve the Holy Spirit. And the more you grieve the Holy Spirit, the less you have of his influence because the Spirit to that degree withdraws. And the less you have of his influence, the harder your heart becomes. Why is it that there are degrees of hardness? Why is it that there are hearts of stone in those who don't believe, but hearts of flesh in those who do? The only difference is the Holy Spirit. But the less you have of the Spirit of God, the harder your heart becomes, and the harder your heart, the weaker your faith. But thankfully, there is something that can be done about this. You don't have to have a hard heart. There's actually a couple of things that you can do, and then one, actually there's three things. Let's, let's just go with three. First of all, stop doubting God's integrity and start believing that is an act of obedience, that is an act of faith. When you read your Bible, believe what it says. Don't follow the example of the disciples who doubted even though they saw, but believe because God does not lie you believe God exists, and I hope you do, if you're Christians here this morning, you need to know that he is absolutely holy. He is absolutely perfect. He cannot do anything wrong. He certainly cannot tell a lie. What God has, has written down, and this is his word, is absolutely true. Stop living as though the Bible isn't true, as though God doesn't exist. I think sometimes we get so imbibed the things of the world, we take in so much, we begin to adopt the way the world thinks. And we begin to think along the lines of God not existing. We begin to make decisions along those lines. We begin to believe that Jesus doesn't exist or that he's not in heaven praying. He's not in heaven uh, ruling and ordering all things for your good. Uh, somehow we begin to think that Jesus really isn't the sovereign that he claims to be. 
don't think along those lines. Those are lies, lies of the enemy, lies from your flesh that want to make you think, your flesh wants to make you think these things aren't true, it's going to resist you all the way. But do not give in to that deception because that's what it is, is deception. It is a lie, but believe the truth. Believe what he says. Live in the reality that he gives to you in the word of God. This is not a fairy tale. This is truth. He is in control. He is exactly who he said he is, and he is doing exactly what he said he would do. Now, secondly, and this, I think, is the step to get us to be able to do this more effectively. Use the means that God has given to you to strengthen your faith, to get more of the Holy Spirit. Use those means more diligently, and especially use this one, although you need to use them all, but use this one because this is the most readily available. This is the one you can do wherever you are. This is the one you should be spending most of your time pursuing the Lord in, and that is prayer. Prayer is so important. Prayer, as been said, moves the hand that moves the world, and certainly that is true only because God has willed to be moved by your prayers. Prayer will bring down more of the Spirit's influence. You have not because you ask not. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And the Holy Spirit is the one who can break up that hardness of heart and give you a softer heart. That will strengthen your faith. Prayer will strengthen it. Now, maybe it's because you don't pray enough that you struggle as much as you do with these things. And that's certainly the case with the disciples. Jesus, when he sent the disciples away, went up to the mountain in order to pray. And during those nine hours that they were struggling against the oars, he was praying, except for the time it took him to walk three miles to get out to where they were. Now, if Jesus, being the Son of God, God in human flesh, needed to pray, how much more do you need to pray? Do I need to pray? We need to pray a lot more than we do. Think about Martin Luther, a great example of prayer. Here was a man who was basically motivating, by God's grace, the Reformation in a very prominent place, very busy place. I mean, he had a lot of things to do, and he was taking care of a lot of people, and he was writing a lot of books. You would think that he was so busy that he wouldn't have time to pray, but it was really just the opposite. Martin Luther once wrote, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day, two hours every morning. I have so much business, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. I've heard this put another way, that I, he, Luther would pray two hours every day, and if his day happened to be very busy, he would pray for three hours. We do just the opposite, don't we? If our day is busy, we cut down on our prayer in order to make more time to do the things that we think we need to do. But we need to realize that if we don't commit our ways to the Lord in prayer, then our time, even though we might have more of it, is going to be far less effective. And we are going to be struggling throughout the day trying to ward off the enemy and his attacks because we haven't spent time with the Lord as we should. E.M. Bounds, who wrote all those books on prayer, who I believe was a Methodist minister during a time when Methodism was still conservative, he wrote this, the little estimate we put on prayer is evident from the little time we give to it. And I think that that's true, isn't it? We don't spend as much time as we do in prayer because we don't see its value. But listen to what Jesus Christ is saying to his disciples. Consider how your own life is going, whether you have a strong faith or a weak faith, and then you decide whether or not you need to pray more. We need to place on prayer the same estimation that our Lord did and give ourselves to it. The more you pray, the stronger your faith will be. But don't forget about the other means of grace as well. Don't forget about the 50 uh, reasons why you should hear the word of God preached. Don't forget the 52 reasons why you should pray. There's plenty of those as well. Don't forget to read the word of God. Don't forget to think about the sacraments, the baptism, 
and the Lord's Supper, which thankfully we're able to celebrate uh, once every week. Don't forget about the need of fellowship. And in your fellowship, to talk mainly about the things of the Lord and not the things of the world, which we often enjoy doing. So there's a couple of things that you can do. Stop doubting God's word and certainly begin praying and using the means of grace. But here's one other thing that will also strengthen your faith. And that is go out and warn other people against the hardness of their hearts. It's only when you really begin to believe these things strongly enough that you can actually go out and do that. And sometimes you may not find within yourself the strength to go out and warn other people about, against their hardness of heart, against you know, their lack of faith, and tell them of their need to believe. Sometimes you struggle with that, and it isn't until you actually go out and do it that the Lord gives you the strength. That's where faith comes in, isn't it? I often found uh, when we used to do street evangelism that uh, there were all these reasons coming to me, all these uh, doubts and hesitations and fears uh, while I was thinking about doing it, but once I actually got out and did it, then the courage came, then the strength came, then the provision of God came. Up until that point, it, it wouldn't have been any faith involved if I just simply had that courage already and went out to do that work. Sometimes it isn't until we take the step of obedience that God actually begins to give us what we need to carry out that command. So going out and taking the gospel to others, warning them about their hardness of heart and their need to have a heart of flesh in order to be saved, that is another way in which your hardness of heart, your lack of faith can be overcome and strengthened. Well, may the Lord help us to learn from these things. This is one of those principles that is key. This is one of those foundational things that if we are not able to overcome, we will not be able to do what God calls us to do. We must overcome hardness of heart, lack of faith. We need a strong faith, a vibrant faith, a living faith, a powerful faith if we are to do what God has called us to do. And so let's take these steps and let's especially commit ourselves to more prayer. I would suggest you begin your prayers with this prayer, Lord, help me to pray. Help me to pray as I should. Help me to overcome all those obstacles to my prayer so that I can get alone with you, spend time with you, and actually pray as I ought to pray. Make that your prayer. Spend time in prayer. And I believe the Lord will give you his grace. He will strengthen your faith. He will strengthen your hearts. He will help you to do what it is he has called you to do. Well, may the Lord help all of us to do this. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in prayer and ask for his help uh, individually.